Ian Brady, Myra Hindley? Ian Brady, Myra Hindley, my thoughts are that they're both very, very damaged, disturbed individuals who have had horrific things happen to them in their own childhoods. Uh, individually, had they not met each other because of their own experiences, they are they are dangerous. But because they came together, it's so rare for two people like that to come together. It's almost like they gave permission for each other to act in their in their sort of antisocial, criminogenic, and murderous ways. So I think it kind of ramped it up. Would they have killed if they hadn't met? I think uh, Ian Brady almost certainly would have. I'm not sure about. Yeah, I think they probably would actually. Yeah, yeah, but probably not to the same degree. Fred and Rose West. Very similar, actually. Very, very similar. So I think they gave each other permission. You get the the feeling that Fred was kind of in charge and Rose was just, I mean, I'm not saying she's not culpable. I think she is culpable, but she just kind of went along with it and it just kept escalating to the point that it couldn't ever be uh, turned away. Uh, Peter Sutcliffe? Peter Sutcliffe is a really interesting one for me because you mentioned this before. He had this diagnosis of schizophrenia and from what I know, the psychiatrist diagnosed him with that during his court case. And then the judge over basically said, I'm not happy with that evidence. I want him re-diagnosed. And then he got sent to prison. But if he got sent to, I know this is not a popular thing to say, but this is my clinical opinion. If he got sent to Broadmoor, I don't think he's mental. I don't think he was not schizophrenic during the time of the murders. Then suddenly schizophrenic later. I think he was schizophrenic the whole time. But it was unpalatable for any for him to, to for it to be seen that there was any excuses for his actions. So the judge kind of quashed the expert evidence so that he ended up going to prison. Ian Huntley. Ian Huntley is, I mean, I was about to say he's a vile person, but pretty much everybody mentions pretty vile. But um, just kind of the level of the manner in which he tried to hide his actions and fake concern is, is really stands out to me. You know, it's just a colossal lack of empathy or shame. And I don't know if you've followed any of the stuff about Levi Belfield. Levi Belfield. I know a bit about him. I know that he likes to provoke other people by lying that he's been involved in cases that he hasn't, which I think is a very bizarre thing to do. It almost feels like he wants this sense of power and control. And the only way that he can lash out to the police or to society is by making these false claims. One of the things that I've always found very interesting, Peter Tobin, I did a lot of work on Peter Tobin and Angus Sinclair. And one of the things that um, was always so sad, that both of those died now, both died from cancer in, in prison over the last year and then uh, two years ago, was that they never gave up the rest of their victims. They never gave up the, um, you know, the locations of where on, and who they murdered. Is that about power control? Is that about, you know, I just literally, because nothing would have happened to them, but they could have given some kind of closure. Yeah, I think it is is similar to what we were saying about Levi Belfield. I think it's just, for whatever reason, they've got this this vitriol, this hatred trapped inside of them, and there's very little ways that they can lash out. I mean, they can they can hurt an individual prisoner or prison guard, but they can't lash out to society. So one of the only ways they can do that is to withhold this information. So it's all absolutely calculated and purposeful. You know, they know that they're upsetting so many people, but they also know that there's no consequences to them doing that. So what's the future for you? What, what are you focused on at the moment? You've obviously got your YouTube channel, which is very successful. And uh, but what is what is uh, what drives you? What gets you up in the morning? What, what do you want to do? <laughs> so I think I'm pretty happy with my professional forensic psychiatry career. I'm, I'm getting a, a decent amount of cases. I don't particularly need more work. <laughs> I've, I can barely sort of juggle it all at the moment. So for me, it's, it's trying to break into the media, which I've been doing for a few years now. So it's, it's an uphill slog, as I'm sure you can attest to. Um, so I've been doing lots of sound bites for documentaries, but I would like bigger kind of platforms. Um, I'd ideally like to present my own crime show. Um, and I seem to have endless talks with producers about it, but it just seems to be talk, talk, meeting, meetings about meetings. So hopefully something will come from all of that. Um, I also would like to be in a space where I can react to new stories. So, you know, Andrew Tate, the Nottingham things that you talked about, so I can give my own kind of psychoanalysis on daytime TV or in new stories. So that's something I'm exploring. But again, there's a ladder that you have to get up and it's a, it's a slippery, yeah. slippery ladder.